Greetings, my name is Barry Satterfield. You've probably heard of me on some YouTube channels or uh, uh, interviews that I've done or some presentations that have been done by invitation. But on this occasion we're presenting something which uh, is coming from our own work and it involves the new developments in astronomy. There have been two major developments here and uh, this is the first of a two-part series talking about this and these developments have the ability to change entirely the outlook that we have on how things have happened out there, what is happening right now, and how we can explain them. And so, welcome to the first of this two-part series. About 300 years ago, an incredibly intelligent man, Sir Isaac Newton, formulated laws of gravity. Whether or not he saw an apple fall from a tree, the fact that things fell down was what got him started. He also noticed that what we now call gravity appeared to be the driving force involved in the moon going around the earth and the planets going around the sun. His mathematics were correct and, since his time, the concept that gravity is not only the driving force for our solar system but for the entire universe as well has been the prevailing explanation for all that we see out there in the cosmos. But gravity is actually a weak force, and that is actually what it is called, a weak force. Every time you pick up a book, or lift your foot off the ground as you walk, you are defying gravity. Now there is something much, much stronger than gravity, magnetism. Even just two magnets that you can hold in your hand can be very difficult to pull apart directly you usually have to slide them apart. In fact, Anthony L. Peratt of Los Alamos National Laboratories pointed out in 1992 that, out in space, electric and magnetic forces can be up to 10 to the 39 times stronger than gravity. That is the numeral 1, followed by 39 zeros. This is especially true in the cases where electric and magnetic forces are acting in plasma which is a key constituent of the cosmos. So what is plasma? We hear about plasma televisions and things like that, but what does that mean? We are all aware of the three states of matter that we deal with every day, solids, liquids and gases. In a solid, the molecules are bound tightly together. If we use water for our illustration, water in its solid form is ice. However, when the temperature increases or the available energy is greater, the solid, ice, melts and becomes a liquid, water. In the liquid, the molecules are only weakly bound together. If the temperature is then increased further or energy is added, the liquid boils and becomes a gas. In this example, water goes to steam. In a gas, the molecules are not bound at all, they move freely. It should be noted that in all of these three states, the atoms and molecules are still intact. But suppose that the heat or other available energy is increased to the point where electrons are stripped off from their host nuclei. This makes a plasma, a mix of freely wandering electrons and atomic nuclei, or, in the case of hydrogen, just electrons and protons. The electrons are negatively charged. The atomic nuclei, called ions, are composed of protons and neutrons and are positively charged. In a plasma, these positive and negative charges move independently of each other. Plasma itself comes in three different modes. At low energy, it is completely transparent and this is referred to as dark mode. Glow mode is when more energy is added and arc mode is the most dramatic. We can see both glow and arc mode in a number of places around us. Glow mode plasmas make up the neon signs in our streets, while arc mode occurs in lightning. The beautiful northern and southern lights are also plasmas. The auroras are plasma sheets and filaments. Since 1973, when measurements were first made, it has been found that the electric currents flowing in auroras and causing them to glow have strengths ranging from 650,000 to over 1 million amperes. In contrast, electric currents in our houses are not much stronger than 25 amperes. The picture on the right shows what the auroras look like 
from an orbiting spacecraft. In order to understand what these auroras are, it is necessary to show that our planet is surrounded by a very large plasma sphere. This is also referred to as a magnetosphere. The lowest layer of this is called our ionosphere. It protects us from what is called the solar wind. The solar wind is a constant discharge from the sun consisting mainly of streams of protons. This flow of positive charges, which constitutes an electric current, could easily destroy life on Earth without our plasma sphere to protect us. Sometimes when the sun discharges at a greater than normal blast of protons in our direction, streams of them enter above our north and south poles, providing the energy in those areas which light up part of our plasma sphere. These are the northern and southern lights, or auroras. Our sun itself is a plasma. Out in space, the innumerable gas clouds and nebulae are also plasma. Because of plasma physics, the science of astronomy is undergoing a major change. After 300 years of gravitational physics, electricity and magnetism are now opening up new possibilities and providing answers to some persistent problems. Because plasma is made up of electric charges in motion, there are inevitably electric currents associated with them. That is the case because any charge or charges in motion, whether positive or negative, constitute an electric current. In this diagram, the current is designated by the letter I. In addition, all electric currents have a circling magnetic field, as shown here. The magnetic field is designated by the letter B in this example. Modern physics indicates it is not possible to have a magnetic field without an electric current to cause it. In the case of plasma, this circling magnetic field constrains the plasma involved to form spaghetti-like filaments, or perhaps sheets. We can see these filaments in toy plasma balls sold in shops, such as the one shown on the left. We see similar effects out in space with the various filaments and sheets in the gas clouds out there, such as the example on the right. For astronomers, this circling magnetic field is important. We find it difficult to measure electric currents directly in space, but measurements of magnetic field strengths are relatively easy. In 1995, the radio astronomer Gerrit Vacheur announced that many clouds of what were thought to be neutral hydrogen atoms, complete with their electrons, were in fact actually ionised, with the electrons stripped off, and were behaving as enormously long plasma filaments. He found from his measurements that the electric currents were up to 10,000 billion amperes flowing in these filaments. This report can be found in Astrophysics and Space Science, Volume 227 in 1995, pages 187 to 198. Later, a huge magnetic slinky was found surrounding a rod-like cloud which made up a significant portion of the constellation Orion. The current flow there must also be enormous. Astronomers were surprised at these conclusions. However, these conclusions were verified by lab experiments. From these experiments, they found that even if gas and dust clouds were only 1% ionised, they would still behave as a fully ionised plasma. Then, in May 1995, Anthony L. Peratt made an important statement in Astrophysics and Space Science, Volume 227, Numbers 1 and 2, pages 97 to 107. He pointed out that even in so-called neutral hydrogen regions of space, where the ionisation of dust and gas is as low as one part in 10,000, electromagnetism is still about 10 million times stronger than gravity. A European Space Agency report dated 1st of June 2015 announced that, and I quote, We detected a wealth of huge plasma filaments, with lengths ranging from a few up to hundreds of light years, 
revealing what seems to be the skeleton of our galaxy. End quote. They concluded from their study that, and I quote, the omnipresent aspect of filamentary structures in the Milky Way galaxy is beyond doubt. End quote. So we have recently discovered that our whole galaxy is basically a structure that is made up of plasma filaments. This image is not our Milky Way galaxy. We do not have the means to photograph our galaxy from outside of it as we are embedded in the spiral arms. Nonetheless, this is a nearby spiral galaxy called M81. Some of the plasma filaments making up the spiral arms of this nearby galaxy can be seen here. On this image, it can be seen that the stars are arranged in these plasma filaments in a manner similar to beads on a string. How does that happen? The common theory of star formation states that matter in clouds of gas and dust like this gradually condenses to form a star. This would take a very long time. They estimate between 10 and 50 million years for the collapse of enough gas and dust to form a star. However, among other difficulties, there is one really major problem with this theory of star formation. As the cloud or nebula of gas and dust collapses and condenses, the atoms and molecules would be in closer contact with each other and would thus be hitting each other more often. The more hits, the more heat, and the greater the pressure. As the heat is generated, the molecules and atoms would be pushing each other apart. Therefore, this heating re-expands the cloud of cosmic dust and gas, preventing the collapse needed to form a concentrated body. Astronomers overcome this problem by invoking the action of carbon monoxide molecules in a very cold cloud which radiates heat into the infrared so the cloud can collapse. They are still debating the process as there are many other difficulties. In any case, however, these gravitational ideas do not explain why stars appear to have formed along plasma filaments like beads on a string, as we now see happening in the Orion grouping. So what is the alternative? Remember the electric currents flowing in wires or in plasma filaments and their circling magnetic fields. It has been found in laboratory experiments with plasma that when the flow rate of the electric current varies or the temperature changes, this sets up an instability in the magnetic field. The circling magnetic field then pinches in on the plasma filament. We can see how easily plasma filaments are disrupted when we look at lightning. We can see the same thing in our plasma balls. The pinching, twisting, turning, kinking and forking are all the results of various types of instability in the magnetic fields involved. The plasma filaments in lightning exist very briefly. However, in space, they are there for the duration. Therefore, when they pinch, something called a plasmoid results. A plasmoid is the concentration of material from the plasma itself, which forms a tight plasma ball and then goes into arc mode. In plasma physics, this pinch is called a Bennett pinch, or Z pinch. It is shown again here in the wings of a butterfly nebula, with a star formed at the focus of the pinch. In the lab experiments, the pinch happens very quickly. Out in space, it also happens quickly and predictably. In the lab, the pinch forms in 40 to 200 nanoseconds. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. When the standard conversion is done for this action out in space, the time it takes for an astronomical plasma filament to pinch and form a plasmoid may be surprisingly short. This is discussed in detail in part two. We call these plasmoids stars. Out in space we see this happening frequently. There are none of the problems associated with the gravitational model. For example, in the ant nebula shown here, the extended plasma filament can be seen going off to the left and right with a magnetic pinch in the centre which has formed a star. Same is true for the butterfly nebula here. The central pinch which has formed a star there is indeed a plasma ball. 
Please note that the wings of the Butterfly Nebula is not the same as the Butterfly Nebula, two different objects. We can actually see the stars forming on filaments like beads on a string in a variety of locations in our own galaxy. For example, in August of 2014, the Green Bank Telescope found these star-forming filaments over 10 light years long in the constellation of Orion. A report was issued in 2016 on the results of a combined study on another filament in Orion. This was done using infrared light by the Herschel Space Observatory, the left image, and the WISE Space Telescope, the right image. The centre image is a combination of images. The study results of the researchers Stutz and Gold were issued on the 16th of May 2016 in Astronomy and Astrophysics, Volume 590, A2. These astronomers concluded that the stars were formed by magnetic processes acting on filaments. A year earlier, an independent study by the European Space Agency resulted in a news release for the 1st of June 2015, in which the following statement was made, and I quote, A detailed study suggests that star formation along filaments is the preferential channel to produce typical stars. While stars that are born away from these dense elongated structures tend to have lower masses. All the evidence indicates that most of the stars within a galaxy are lined up along the plasma filaments like beads on a string. But what about the galaxies themselves? Are they just scattered throughout space or is there some kind of filamentary structure to them as well? Astronomy maps of galaxy positions like this one show us that, yes, the galaxies themselves are indeed arranged along long strings. On this map, every yellow, green and blue dot is a galaxy position. The red dots are galaxy clusters and the blue lines are the filaments. Mapping nearby galaxies and clusters of galaxies reveals that they certainly have a filamentary distribution. This came as a surprise to gravitational astronomers when it was first discovered, even though it had been predicted years earlier by plasma scientists. For example, this plot of the position of nearby galaxies and clusters shows its filamentary nature. Each dot is a galaxy, and the main clusters have been labelled. Our location is indicated by the red arrow near the centre. A filamentary structure for the universe was predicted by plasma physics pioneer Hannes Alphen in 1963 and proven correct in 1991. Within the galaxies themselves, the spin axes of stars are aligned along their plasma filaments. If indeed the galaxies are actually formed by and found on giant plasma filaments, shouldn't their spin axes also be aligned? In 2010, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey proved it was certainly true for nearby galaxies, but more recently, in November of 2014, the results of data from the most distant parts of the universe were published. It was reported that the Very Large Telescope, VLT in Chile, found the spin axes of 93 very distant galaxies were aligned along filaments, as shown on the map on the screen now. In part, the results were reported as follows. Quote, the new VLT results indicate that their rotation axes tend to be parallel to the large-scale structures in which they find themselves embedded. End quote. The lead researcher, Professor Damien Hatzmikers, estimated that the probability that these alignments were simply the result of chance is less than 1%. He stated that, and I quote, The first odd thing we noted was that these rotation axes were aligned with each other, despite the fact that they are separated by billions of light years. End quote. There is no way gravity can account for these alignments, especially over such large distances. This is why the result came as such a shock to astronomers. Yet an alignment is normal and expected part of galaxy formation 
in plasma astronomy. How do we know what the spin axes are for these distant galaxies? We know because of something called quasars. Quasars are the extremely bright centres of distant galaxies, so bright that the galaxy around it can't be seen unless the light from the central quasar is blocked out. These brilliant quasars have enormous focused jets of ionised material or plasma erupting from their centre along their spin axes. These jets tell us where the spin axes are. This is not a comet. This is a photograph of a quasar with one of its focus jets. Going back to a previous picture, this lineup of quasars, which is what this actually shows, came as a complete shock to astronomers in November the 20th, 2014. This calls into question the gravitational origin for galaxies, as that cannot account for the alignment of their spin axes in any way, either with or without dark matter. However, plasma physics can. Let us look at this in a little more detail to find out why. Allow us to introduce you to Anthony L. Peratt from Los Alamos National Laboratories. His lab experiments give us the basis for understanding how plasma physics and astronomy fit in with the observational data. We start with a simple experiment that can be done in the lab. Two parallel plasma filaments behave in the same way as two parallel wires carrying an electric current. If two such wires are set up in the lab, the following observations can be made. If the current in the wires are anti-parallel, the wires, and likewise plasma filaments, will repel each other. Alternately, if the currents are parallel, then the wires and filaments will attract each other. The reason in both cases is the repulsive or attractive action of the circling magnetic fields around the currents in the parallel wires or filaments. Currents in plasma filaments are called Birkeland currents. They spiral around each other in the typical way shown here, whether out in space, as shown in the left and centre frames, or in the lab, as shown on the right. Peratt's lab experiments and simulations gave this interaction sequence with plasma filaments and parallel currents. We're looking down the long axis of two plasma filaments in the lab at the point of their closest approach, which is where they interact. In a very short amount of time, we can see what they are doing. The result was that miniature galaxies were formed in the lab at the point of interaction of the plasma filaments. It was found that all known types of galaxy were formed in the lab by just two or three interacting filaments, even though up to 12 filaments were used. This diagram shows what was happening. Now, let's see if the same thing happens out in space. As two filaments approach, the plasma between them becomes concentrated. In the lab, the equivalent of double radio galaxies form. The two current filaments actually form the radio lobes with plasma jets at 90 degrees. The picture on the right shows exactly the same thing happening in what is called a radio galaxy. As the interaction continues in the lab and filaments approach more closely, the equivalent of quasars and their jets develop, along with active galactic nuclei. Again, this is exactly what we see in space. This image comes from the European Southern Observatory. The centres of all distant galaxies show these incredibly bright quasars. As the two filaments continue interacting, they begin to merge. This produces what appears to be a massive bright sphere of light. We can see this happening in space with the giant elliptical galaxy M87 in Virgo. Here, billions of stars are formed within this sphere. On the right, a close-up shows M87 still has a prominent plasma jet erupting from the centre. Next, in the interaction sequence, both in the lab and in space, a barred spiral galaxy forms, rather like NGC 1300 in the constellation Eridanus. The final stage of galaxy formation is seen in the magnificent full spiral galaxies like this one, 
M101, sometimes called the Pinwheel Galaxy. This same final stage is also seen in the lab. The number of spiral arms that develop is dependent upon the parameters governing the interaction. According to plasma physics, stars form from the Z-pinch instabilities like beads on a string in the spiral arms. In addition, all galaxies on the same interacting filaments will have their spin axes aligned along the filament too. All this accords with observational evidence. Peratt's experiments allowed a time conversion to be made from miniature galaxy formation times in the lab to actual galaxy formation times out in space using the known values of physical parameters. When the conversion is applied to the lab data, then it appears that plasma processes are capable of forming galaxies in a quite short period of time compared with the one billion years required on the gravitational approach. This overcomes a time problem that gravitational methods of galaxy formation have and that will be discussed in part two. These facts and the alignment of galaxy spin axes suggest all galaxies have an electric circuit. That has been studied for galaxies like M82 and M51. Here it can be seen that the observational evidence indicates that the current comes in via the spiral arms and goes out at the nucleus. This explains jets in the quasars at galaxy centres where the electric current and magnetic fields come to a focus. A discovery announced on the 26th of April 2015 tends to support this whole approach. The magnetic field strengths near the base of quasar jets was measured as about 200 million gauss. The Earth's magnetic field is generally less than one gauss. Magnetic fields can only be produced by electric currents. In this case, the current would have to be of the order of 10 to the 20th amps. Amazingly, this amperage is the same as that which Peratt predicted in 1991. This is the value he obtained for the electric current strength at galaxy centres when plasma processes in the lab were upscaled to those operating in space. This can be seen in Physics of the Plasma Universe, page 63. So, if plasma explanations are basically correct, why has it taken so long for anyone to recognise this? The story involves primarily two men. In the early 20th century, Christian Birkeland created the plasma ball, which he called a Torella. He was able to show in his experiments that he could get the equivalent of auroras in his plasma ball. He concluded that auroras were caused by plasma in our upper atmosphere, being energised by currents from the sun. Enter Sidney Chapman, a renowned mathematician and physicist from England. He completely denounced Birkeland's work in plasma experiments. It was Chapman that the scientific world listened to, and it was not until he died in 1970 that plasma physics again began to be examined. Plasma physics has developed since the 1990s and is beginning to overturn the old gravitational way of thinking. It has been found that over 99% of all matter in the cosmos is actually in the form of plasma. The accumulated evidence suggests that astronomical objects are formed by plasma processes rather than gravitational ones. Furthermore, these plasma processes are all significantly faster than gravity. With a gravitational approach, the time it takes for various objects to form is a real problem which we will address in part two. Plasma physics, linked with another development also discussed in part two, overcomes this problem completely. At the moment, in 2017, there are still many astronomers who follow the gravitational physics approach for all that they see. This approach to cosmology colours their outlook and their understanding of what may be really happening in the universe around us. But a vocal minority of astronomers, and most members of the IEEE, 
the International Electric and Electronic Engineers, are paying serious attention to plasma physics as it relates to astronomy, with its new insights and resolutions of outstanding problems. Thank you very much for your time and attention. This is really appreciated. And don't forget to stay tuned for part two.